So uh, as uh, Mendeley said, I'm going to present uh, some new results that we got in our group. Some of them are not so new, they're about two years old, so some of you might have seen them already. Uh, on doing a uh, pump probe microscopy in wide field configuration. So uh, since I know that this is not uh, a very heavy uh, institute in uh, optics, I'm going to uh, orient the talk a little bit in a, a more basic way so that I, I cover why we're doing these things and what we want to accomplish. So uh, I'm first going to talk about all optical locking imaging, which is the trick that allows us to combine holography with femtosecond pulses to do the pump probe imaging, uh, then show some uh, 3D imaging results using this technique, and finally discuss about uh, a hot carrier and hot exciton diffusion with femtosecond timescale resolution uh, using this uh, wide field microscope that we built. So uh, this work was not done by me alone. So this originally started with this guy, Mats Liebel, uh, who was a postdoc in the group of Nick von Huls in Nick for Barcelona. So uh, he had the original idea of uh, the, the holographic trick that I'm going to present to you soon. And uh, he mentioned it to us. He came to, uh, to Milan. We developed the experiment in Milan. Everything worked. And we've been developing it ever since. Um, nowadays, I got two PhD students, Martin Herman and Federico Vizentin. Uh, and uh, uh, my previous uh, postdoc supervisor in Milan, Giulio uh, Cerullo, is uh, the owner of the labs where we are doing this research. So, uh, in Milan, we are very much into uh, femtosecond uh, spectroscopy. Uh, and the motivation for femtosecond spectroscopy is always uh, the question how do you observe uh, an event that's very fast in time? And the concept is clear. If you want to see something fast, you need to have experimental control over something that's even faster. Uh, and the, the fastest things that we have control over are uh, ultra short uh, laser pulses. So uh, there are many ways uh, to deal with ultra short laser pulses. Specifically, the way we do it in Milan is to reach uh, uh, sub 10 femtosecond laser pulses. And uh, basically, we start with a commercially available uh, titanium sapphire amplified laser system with repetition rates of the order of one or two kilohertz. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of energy, and that allows us to use a nonlinear optical phenomena to obtain, for instance, supercontinuum generation by tight focusing on a crystal or uh, doing optical parametric amplification. And that gives us frequency conversion capabilities. So we start with something that's uh, at 800 nanometers, 100 femtoseconds, and then we use nonlinear optics to convert spectrally to more or less anything we need. Uh, and uh, in general, we can get to sub-10 femtosecond uh, 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 pulse durations with this type of approach. And at this point, one might ask, okay, why are you doing 7 femtoseconds and not 1 femtosecond? So <laughs> if you're not familiar with uh, uh, ultra-short pulses, the shortest pulse you can make is a single cycle of oscillation of the electric field. So uh, how short that can be in time depends very much on the carrier wavelength of the pulse that you're generating. So in the vis for visible light, the optical cycle has between uh, one point something and uh, three femtoseconds. So that basically means that a single cycle pulse would be in the order of five femtoseconds or three or uh, something like that. So if you want to stay, stick to the visible near infrared, you're not going to get pulses that are much shorter than uh, 10 femtoseconds because you're really reaching the single cycle boundary. So all the other second science that you might have seen around, it's always going to uh, um, X-rays and uh, more uh, um, higher energy photons. So here we are sticking to this. The more we can do is go to the ultraviolet. And uh, the ultraviolet is a bit of a tricky region because there's a lot of uh, dispersion. So uh, one thing you might have realized already is that uh, uh, there's no such a thing as a 5.7 femtosecond pulse like I'm drawing here in this way. Because as the pulse propagates, there's going to be dispersion, and the blue and the red parts of your spectrum are going to propagate with different uh, uh, group velocities. So really what we mean when we discuss ultra-short pulses is that we make them short at the position of the sample, so then we can do spectroscopy with a very high time resolution. So basically, whatever dispersion your, optical, your instrument has, you have to have an arm of the instrument where you add the opposite sign dispersion so that right at the sample, everything arrives at the same time. And in the UV, this is quite tricky because dispersion is 
uh, very high. But uh, basically, using this approach that we have in England, we can build all these uh, nice short poses. And as a disclaimer, working with these guys, because of the dispersion problem that I just mentioned, can be quite tricky. So uh, there is a happier place to be, which is the range of 100 femtoseconds, because then your bandwidth in the visible is around 10 nanometers. And if you have 10 nanometers bandwidth, the dispersion problems are very well under control. It's very hard to chirp a pulse that is uh, 10 nanometers in bandwidth. So most of the results that I'm going to discuss today are going to be using 100 femtosecond pulses because I wanted to make my life easy. I can do 10 if I ever have the scientific case to do it. But uh, a lot of these are new experiments that I'm demonstrating, so we're sticking to 100 femto. Okay, fine. We have 100 uh, uh, short pulses. How can we use them to reveal ultra-fast dynamics? Okay, so the first concept is that you're going to start with a laser that is a train of pulses. You're going to have two uh, optical um, uh, beams or, or pulses on your sample. One that we call the pump, that is going to be modulated with an optical chopper, which is just this fan that rotates synchronously with the output of the laser, so that it blocks every other shot of the laser. And that is going to resonantly excite the sample. At the same spot of the sample, you overlap a probe beam that has pulses that are not chopped. So every shot of the probe is there. You go through a detector that is fast, that allows you to read every shot of the laser. And then what you can do is, if you can read every shot of the laser, you can see the spectrum of the probe when the pump is on, measure the spectrum of the probe when the pump is off, do the, 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 the subtraction of one minus the other, normalize it, and that gives you something that is proportional to the difference in transmission or in absorption of different electronic or vibrational bands of the sample because of the excitation with the pump. So the pump excites, now the sample is no longer in the ground state, that creates a slight modification in the optical properties, and you can see this slight modification by doing the pump one minus pump off trick that we have here. And since we can experimentally control the time delay between pump and probe pulses with very high precision, we can repeat this experiment for many pump probe time delays, and we can get this response uh, as a function of time, exploiting the fact that our pulses are very short, we get a very high time resolution. So this is talking about events that are repetitive. In general, the idea is every time your pump arrives, you trigger the same physics that is going to repeat in the same way every time. If you're looking at uh, uh, non-repetitive events, then there are techniques for that, but it's a different game. And this is proportional to the third order polarization of the sample, if you want to use the language of nonlinear optics. So typically, the setup looks something like this. Have a commercial laser, do some optical conversion, compress the pulses, and then we use a delay stage to generate the time delay between pump and probe. So basically, by Moving mirrors on the optical table, we can make the path, the optical path of one of the pulses longer or shorter, because if it's the, move, the mirror is further away, the beam propagates for longer, it will arrive later. So uh, that gives us a very nice way to control the time delay between the two pulses. So you can see here for one femtosecond, we need something like 300 nanometers, which is something that's achievable. Uh, it goes kind of crazy if you want very long delays, like in the microseconds you would need a, a ridiculously long delay stage. But for that, if you want the long time the scales, then you, you have to do the delays electronically. But if you want to do from femtoseconds to nanoseconds, you're fine by using these mechanical delay stages. Um, okay, and then you have a, your propulse that is usually just a super continuum that you generate by tight focusing the fundamental at a, a crystal. And the sensitivities that you can achieve depend very much on the laser repetition rate. So if you have a, a higher repetition rate, so more pulses per second, you can get higher sensitivity. But then the problem is uh, maybe the hypothesis that your sample recovers back to the ground state between consecutive laser shots might not be true. So if you have very long-lived excited states, you want to be at a lower repetition rate even if that gives you less sensitivity. Okay, so which signals do you get out of this type of technique? So let's imagine that our pump arrived here, you have this sample with a few valence bands, a few conduction bands, and you've promoted some electrons 
from the valence band one to the conduction band one. What are the different types of physics that are going to give from probe signals? Well, for one, uh, there are missing electrons in this valence band here. So since there are missing electrons after the, the pump excited the sample, the probe is not going to see those electrons anymore. So it's going to be transmitted more than it would be without pump. So they get, that means that the probe is going to be absorbed less. It gives you a negative signal in absorption. Now there's another phenomenon that also gives a negative sign in absorption, which is the presence of these electrons here in the conduction band will create a Pauli blocking effect. So absorption from other, from other valence bands to this same conduction band are also going to show a signal because these electrons here in conduction band one are Pauli blocking absorption from the other valence bands too. So uh, Pauli blocking and uh, the, the, the presence of holes in the valence band give signals. Moreover, we also get uh, stimulated emission signals. If there are electrons and holes and they can recombine radiatively, the probe induces stimulated emission. The photon propagates coherently with the probe. There's more light, which it looks like less absorption. So if there is stimulated emission allowed, it can give you also negative signals. And finally, these electrons now can absorb light and be promoted further up to another conduction band or even the same conduction band. Or if there are spectral shifts that create some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, absorption in wavelengths that previously was not there, that also can give you a positive signal that is a photo-induced absorption. So there's a lot going on. Uh, these techniques are typically complementary with the time result fluorescence, because of course in time result fluorescence, you only see something when there is an electron and a hole recombining. And here we also see things uh, from dark states. Um, so uh, what does the data typically look like? So this is some example data set. The signal to noise isn't great because the signals are really tiny for this specific sample. But uh, uh, you can see here, I get a map where I have the wavelength axis on the vertical axis, the time axis on the horizontal, uh, and the pump probe signal, the transient absorption signal is shown uh, in, uh, in the color scale. So uh, you can see that if I do a vertical cut uh, for each, time delay between pump and probe, I get different spectra. And so it's re so you see this, uh, this evolution in the spectrum are, is reflecting the photophysics that's taking place in my sample as a function of time. And then if I, instead of taking vertical cuts, I take horizontal cuts, I select a wavelength, and I can see the kinetic behavior for that specific wavelength as a function of time. And you can see, for instance, here the green has a rise in the first picosecond, and the blue has a decay, so you can start interpreting the photophysics of the sample by looking at the behavior of the different electronic bands that the sample has. So uh, it, it can give you a lot of information and it's uh, super useful when studying physical chemistry. So this is the, the core of the technique. Uh, and now to the stuff that I'm not gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk about pump probe microscopy in this, uh, in this seminar. But uh, we've been doing work in studying like a hot carrier, uh, sorry, hot electrons uh, uh, hot electron transferring hybrid semiconductor systems uh, with very ultra, uh, with ultra short pulses. I'm not going to mention any of that today. Uh, also, something for organic photovoltaics, like the data that I mentioned that I just showed you now is from such project. I'm also not going to mention any of that. So, if anybody's interested in these fields, they can talk to me at a later moment. Uh, but today, I'm going to go back to something else, which is everything that I talked about today as you may have understood, is an ensemble measurement. I am photo exciting with a spot that might have whatever, 100 micron in diameter, and I'm seeing the average behavior in changing the transmission of the probe. So I have a lot of nano objects in my, in my uh, focal volume, or if I am doing like solid state, I have a lot of, uh, uh, of a large area of the sample. So I'm getting an average value out of my measurements. There are single molecule techniques, uh, and single molecule techniques are quite fascinating, but they have a different problem because they see a single nano object and you have no idea how representative of the overall context that one nano object that you see is. So ideally, one would like to have a technique that has the ability to see the transient results for many nano objects, but not just the single one and not just the average one. And then you run into trouble because all of the single molecule techniques are based in locking detection. 
you have uh, uh, an avalanche photodiode as your detector that gives you many, many electrons, and you need them because the signal from a single nano object is very tiny. So you need to get as many electrons, as many photons as you can, and then they modulate the signal very fast using a locking amplifier in order to get anything out of the massive background that you have, since the nano object is so much smaller than your, the smallest optical spot that you can generate. To see something large with many nano objects, you'd have to use a camera. But the problem with cameras is that they are painfully slow. So uh, you can have many points, but each pixel has very few electrons per pixel, and you don't get a lot of statistics by using a camera. So uh, how can we get the best of both worlds here in this type of configuration? Well, uh, the trick is through holography. And at this point, you might see what Wikipedia used to say about holography. They had this amazing sentence here, which now is gone. So uh, since uh, even Wikipedia didn't know what holography was back as far back as two years ago, I'm going to explain exactly what it means to us in the context of this talk today. So now comes the imaging stuff. Uh, let's imagine that I have this microscope here. I'm illuminating it with a beam that later is going to be the probe. I, make a, I collect light that's scattered from, say, a bunch of nanoparticles scattered on a glass with this objective. I put a dark field mask so that I collect only scattering and not the transmitted light. And I image that into a camera. That gives me an image like this. Um, this image is uh, measuring basically the square modules of the electric field because that's what detectors do. You don't measure the electric field, you measure the square modules. If you go in and out of focus, this is what you get. So this is not nothing with holography here. What I mean by holography is a, a type of holography that's called off-axis holography. I'm coming here with a reference wave that interferes with the image, but coming with an angle like this. If I do that, my sensor is going to see some interference fringes, and here they are aligned along the diagonal uh, orientation of the camera. If I do a 2D Fourier transform of, the, uh, of my sensor, in case space, what I get is a zero order term that has the electric field square of the signal and the reference. And then here at the diagonal, I'm going to get the interference term between both of them. Now I can crop these guys, move them back to zero in case space, and do an inverse Fourier transform. And if I do that, I can recover both the amplitude and the phase of uh, the, the image. So that's nice. I am uh, uh, not only getting the, the square modules of the electric field, but I get amplitude and phase. So this is what I mean by holography. Use uh, interference with a known wave to recover amplitude and phase of the electric field. Okay, so this is fun because it gives us access to digital holography tools. So digital holography is when you get some stuff that's interfering uh, with a reference wave, and then you post-process using the information of the electric field that you know, plus equations, for instance, the angular spectrum method, that allow you, for instance, to take an object that's out of focus and refocus it uh, perfectly with your computer after the measurement. So here, just to give you an example of that happening, I'm moving the sample out of focus. I have the amplitude and the phase images. I can post-process it in such a way that I get the same image every time. And I know digitally through my uh, propagation algorithm how far out of focus I was and in which direction. So this is static. There's no ultra fast here at all. Uh, but this is something that comes as a bonus for all the stuff that I'm going to talk later. Um, and it, it really works. It, you can go very far with this uh, digital holography stuff. So here you can see an image that is just slightly out of focus. We can refocus it. And then we move far out of focus and crazy far out of focus. This is uh, 33 uh, micron out of focus. And you can still refocus the image. So, uh, uh, and the, the signal intensity stays the same. So the limit for this uh, refocusing technique, obviously, is I, can, I, I need a sparse sample. So if I have something blocking the view from something behind, it's going to fail. But as long as I have a sparse enough sample with single objects, I can always use these as a quasi-3D method. Um, so that's fine. Now how, let's make this thing go ultra-fast. Okay, so the idea to make this go ultra-fast, of course, you need to add a photo excitation, a pump pulse, which goes through a chopper, a delay stage, 
And here we're propagating the pump and probe collinearly at the sample. To make this uh, thing go ultra fast, we add a second reference in the off-axis holography. And we do that by generating the both references uh, using a 2D grating. So we take two orders of the 2D grating, we relay image the grating into the camera, and that is something quite technical, but if you think about it, I'm using femtosecond poses and I'm doing holography. So the poses have to overlap perfectly and across the entire sensor. And that's not a given. If you have a wave from tilt, you're not gonna have a perfect overlap. So this is a trick that solves that problem. If you wanna know more, you can talk to me later. But um, it's something that is done also in some 2D electronic spectroscopy techniques. Uh, and now we have these two references. They come from different corners of a square. So they have different K vectors when they arrive at the sample. And we chop the references, just like we chop the pump. And now we have this nice chopping sequence. So you can see that the pump on frames are coincident only with one reference. And the pump off frames are coincident with the other reference. So now my camera can be as slow as it wants that I am getting pump on always interfering with one reference and pump off always interfering with the other. So what happens? Since the references are coming from different K vectors, they get separated when I do this Fourier transform and I go to K space. One reference has interference terms in the diagonal. The other one has the interference terms in the anti-diagonal. And I have the same shots, the subsequent shots of pump on and pump off acquired here, regardless of how slow my camera is. So I can do the inverse Fourier transform trick and I can recover two images out of one. One interfering with one reference, the other interfering with the other reference, only that I know that one reference is pump on, the other reference is pump off, and I can subtract the two images pixel by pixel and I get a pump probe image covering the entire field of view. So now I can see the single uh, gold nanoparticles in their pump probe signal uh, uh, for, for uh, the entire field of view of maybe 100 micron here. So uh, just as a proof of concept, I am scanning the delay stage between pump and probe to convince you that this is real. And as I do that, if I look at the, the pump off reference images, I get something that is flat. And if I look at the pump on reference images, I find time zero of time pump probe delay and then I see the relaxation kinetics of the hot electrons generated in the gold nanoparticles as a function of time. Uh, and we chose gold nanoparticles to validate these because they are extremely well known. Their optical properties and uh, ultra-fast properties are very well known. So you can see here that only in the pump on frames, uh, sorry, in the pump on arm, we have the, the pump probe signal of the nanoparticles. The nice thing about this is that if you have a slow detector, you would have to do the pump probe, uh, uh, modulate the pump as slow as your detector is. So you'd end up with a shopping sequence like this. You'd get four pumps on, then four pumps off, then four pumps on, and so on and so forth, and subtract like that. But the problem is that the noise correlation between the probe here and the probe here is worse than between consecutive shots. So you start adding uh, non-shot noise to your measurement, and here I'm showing you the comparison of the noise. So if you look at the pump on and pump off uh, uh, fluctuations, they are crazy, but they are almost perfectly correlated. So when I divide one by the other, I end up with a uh, Poisson distribution that is just following how many photons I am acquiring. So I end up with a shot noise limited measurement despite having a very slow detector. And that is the key advantage of this technique. So uh, to prove that it works, we have done some spectroscopy with gold nanoparticles here by selectively changing the wavelength of the probe, because we know that the, the pump probe sign changes, uh, pump probe signal changes sign, and you can see here it's positive, here it's negative, here some are positive, some are negative, because of course they are slightly different in size, they are in a slightly different environment, and we can see the, the properties of each single one. So if you're near a zero point crossing, some will be positive, some will be negative. In an ensemble measurement, you'd get zero. Here, I can see which ones are where. Um, and uh, well, we've characterized the spectroscopy of the gold nanoparticles uh, quite thoroughly. This has been published uh, by us, uh, I think, uh, last year. Um, but I guess the key point that I wanted to hammer home is the fact that, for one, we are sensitive. 
So uh, by doing this differential measurement, uh, we can be more sensitive than by looking at the steady state. So here you can see that in the steady state image, if I have 100 nanometer gold nanoparticles, they scatter a lot of light, they're very easy to see. Even if my resolution is not as good, I see them as the point spread function. Uh, and I see the bump probe signal. But if I go to smaller and smaller nanoparticles here reaching 20 nanometers, here I see nothing. But when I do the pump probe, since the pump probe signal uh, appears, uh, is demodulated, I can see them because there's this massive jump as I scan the time delay. So you could think about doing some biological measurements uh, of this by using the gold nanoparticles as a, an observable, because you could tag them to meet some biomolecule that you want, and you could image them like this in a way that you would have the image of the cell in steady state where you see everything that scatters, but uh, when you do the pump probe image, you would see only where the nanoparticles are. So you have two images at once. You have one where you see everything that scatters, and you have the other one where you see only where the nanoparticles are. And to prove that, I'm showing you here two different experiments, one with 100 nanometer latex beads, and one with 60 nanometer gold nanoparticles. You can see that the scattering amplitudes in steady state are quite similar. But of course, if I look at the pump probe signal, I only see pump probe signal for the gold, but not for the latex. So I can differentiate different scattering objects based on the, the, where uh, the pump probe signals are. So um, this is nice. And obviously, the, the whole digital holography trickery that I was talking about before works equally as well. For the one, I'm showing the same nanoparticle, but uh, uh, for different pump probe time delays. So in this one on the right, as long as the time delay is negative, you will see just noise. And at the moment that you cross time zero and pump, probe, pump and probe overlap, the nanoparticle is going to appear here in the pump probe image as well. So there you go. You can see here that here you, don't, you just see some craziness. Here you see the nanoparticle swimming and we're localizing it in depth. And here, when you cross time zero, it appears, and then the pump probe signal decays, it disappears again. If you wanted to do some serious imaging, you just stay near time zero. But here is a demonstration, so <coughs> we just wanted to have fun, and it's going to appear at the same position here. So, um, okay. So uh, I, I hope I could convince you that we managed to get uh, uh, what Giulio called, uh, Giulio called, not Giulio, Giulio is a guy in Italy. We call the technique to stalk a single nanoparticle. Um, and we can do the pump probe of that as well, which is not a very useful measurement, but it's still quite fun to do. Uh, but now the question that appears is, so okay, this uh, nanoparticle stuff is more in the interest of the Barcelona people because they do a lot of bio works. Uh, I am more interested in spectroscopy of materials. So the question is, can we do this, apply this technique in some way, shape, or form to the benefit of studying, uh, for instance, excited states in semiconductors. So there's been some papers where people use the concept of photo exciting a single diffraction limited uh, uh, Gaussian spot, generating a spatially dependent distribution of carriers. And then by looking at how the distribution of carriers uh, broadens as a function of pump rope time delay, they studied the diffusion of uh, hot excitons or hot carriers in semiconductor samples. And the question is, okay, uh, I have uh, now this nice microscope where I have a very large field of view. If I excite a single spot that is diffraction limited, my large field of view is completely useless, right? Because then I don't need it anymore. And for all the nanoparticle work that I've shown before, the, the excitation spot was as large as the field of view. So I excited everything with a Gaussian spot and, uh, well, I don't have this type of spatial resolution for a, a well-defined uh, um, distribution of uh, carriers. So, okay, there's been quite a lot, actually, of papers like this, so we were quite interested in trying to, to make some application. Uh, and basically, their limitation is that they have one single bump spot. So, for instance, if they're studying a sample like in organic photovoltaics or uh, a perovskite that are notoriously heterogeneous, how do they know that the spot that they measured is representative of the sample overall? I mean, they don't. They have to do maybe 20 measurements in a row, which is going to take 20 days of the life of a PhD student, and then uh, uh, many months to analyze all the stuff to see that the results are consistent, and who knows, right? 
So uh, how can we employ our setup for that? We came up with this trick, which is the pinhole array. So basically, we have a sheet of gold with a bunch of pinholes on it. We come with a pump beam from the back of the objective, and we use our objective and another lens to relay image this pinhole array, the diffraction from this pinhole array, at the sample position. So now I can fill up my sample position with 100 excitation spots, each of which is Gaussian. And now I can see through the pump probe signal at and around each of these hundred spots how the, the evolution of the distribution of carriers is taking place um, covering a very large area of the sample. Um, so uh, to, uh, to give you an example, I'm going to show some results on a, a methyl ammonium lead bromide perovskite, which was provided by the group of uh, Giulia Grancini in the uh, University of Pavia. So uh, the, the sample looks like this. It's quite heterogeneous. It's a polycrystalline thin film. Um, so it's an aggregate of, uh, uh, of microcrystals. Um, and if you do, the absorption is like uh, the black curve here. So it has a band gap with an exciton at around uh, 525 nanometers. So we select the probe wavelength at this, uh, at this wavelength. Because at this uh, wavelength, what we, the pump probe signal that we see is proportional to the number of carriers uh, that are present uh, at the sample. And we photo excite above gap with uh, 400 nanometers. So we're providing more than one electron volt of excess energy to the carriers at time zero. Um, so the pump probe signal looks <coughs> something like this. You see that uh, at, it, at early times, it has this negative feature here. That is a band gap renormalization because of the presence of hot carriers. And this disappears as the hot carriers cool down on time scales of uh, a few hundred femtoseconds. So, uh, and afterwards, there are the, the, the recombination kinetics of the, of the uh, photogenerated carriers. Another thing that I should mention is that uh, our signal is linear with the intensity of the pump. So if I, increase, if I multiply the pump intensity by 2 or by 3 at low fluences, meaning low photons per square centimeter, this goes linearly up. But eventually it saturates. Because, of course, there is a certain point where the sample can no longer physically absorb more photons. So if I increase the power, uh, eventually I reach this saturation point. And that's kind of important because when people were doing femtosecond spectroscopy, they never think that their excitation spots uh, have a, 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 a photon flux that is a function of the position. But in my case, this is absolutely non-negligible. That's all that I have. So we have to keep in mind that as we change the, the excitation intensities to higher values, I might start to see some saturation like this. And if you're at high excitation fluences, you're also going to start inducing nonlinear kinetics in the sample. For instance, Auger recombination. So here you can see the data of the main uh, bleach peak of this sample uh, for four different excitation fluences. And you can see that at high excitation uh, powers, the kinetic decays faster. And that is because of Auger recombination, where many carriers recombine um, and you just uh, lose uh, signal. So this is something to keep in mind when analyzing these experiments because, of course, my kinetics are going to be dependent on space and uh, fluence, and fluence is dependent on space. So, uh, fine. So let's look what happens. So this is uh, the pump probe image for different times. And you can see that uh, uh, when I uh, cross time zero, suddenly all the points appear. Some have higher signals, some have smaller signals, probably because of heterogeneity. Um, and uh, if I go and look at different spots, in uh, different pixels in one spot, let's call it like this, I can see that at the center I have a decay. Uh, near the, the edges there's a part that's flat, and um, at the edges and away from the edges there's a rising signal. So this is literally some small diffusion that's taking place as shown by the rise of this signal here, which is at the edge of the excitation spot. Uh, so fine. Uh, I can see the diffusion on one spot, and it turned out that this sample was actually quite uh, homogeneous. So we fitted this uh, evolution, and uh, for the different spots, there was not a lot of difference. So that made us wonder one thing. Okay, if the sample is heterogeneous, we can see the heterogeneity in those statistical analysis, but what if it is not? Well, 
at this point, what I can do is I can average the spots. So here, what I'm showing you is an area around one of these spots at a negative time delay. So you're looking at noise here. This is just the noise of the measurement. And I'm taking 200 scans, 300 scans, 1,500 scans. So the noise starts to average out. So uh, it gets uh, smaller and smaller. Now, if instead of seeing one single spot, I average all my 100 spots, of course, I'm going to get a crazy signal to noise boost because I'm acquiring many, many more points and averaging them. And indeed, that's what happens. So since the signal to noise is proportional to the square root of the number of scans, uh, it's also proportional to the square root of the number of spots. So now the fact that I can do 100 spots in one single measurement all in parallel means that if my sample is heterogeneous, I can average them all together and I can get a signal to noise increase by a factor of 10 if I have 100 spots, which is great because we have all this story about the OGA recombination that I was mentioning before. So, um, uh, okay, this is a lot of analysis that I will skip, but this is the, uh, the same measurement taking on the same sample for two different excitation fluences. So you can see here that on the left you have high fluence, and you can see that the spots are already much larger at time zero than they were at uh, uh, lower fluence. That's naturally because I'm saturating the absorption of the sample, so I can no longer absorb more photons at the center, the signal saturates, and I get something flat. Uh, whereas uh, for the low fluence, I get something that is closer to the spot that I get by putting a mirror at the sample position and characterizing the bump. Uh, and then in both cases, I can uh, do an analysis by looking at uh, how my, my Gaussian distribution evolves as a function of time and I can extract a diffusion coefficient. And as you can see, there are two characteristic time scales here. One that is in the first picosecond, when I still have the presence of hot carriers at the sample, and another one that is present only uh, at, uh, that is much smaller, and it's present at long time uh, uh, scales. So uh, what's happening here? Okay, if you have a lot of hot carriers in the sample, there's a ballistic regime of diffusion that is before uh, the, um, the carriers lose their uh, excess kinetic energy, where they diffuse by quite large distances. And this is actually apparently increased for high fluences, which can be explained by, or uh, at least we're rationalizing by thinking that, okay, if you're at a very high fluence, you're not only getting uh, um, uh, the excess energy which should be the same, but you're also getting more carrier-carrier scattering because the density of carriers is so much higher. And that apparently gives a, a larger diffusion <coughs> coefficient. Um, but then the question is, at the slow time scales, after the excess, uh, excess energy has been uh, dissipated into the lattice, the high fluence one appears to be diffusing much faster than the low fluence one. And that is not a real result, but just an artifact, because at the center of my spot, I have more carriers per square centimeter, there's more OGR recombination, and then there's a faster decay of the signal at the center re respect to the edges. So if I have something that looks like this, but only the center decays, it looks like it got fat, but it didn't. It's just that the center is decaying faster than the edges, and if you don't think very carefully about it, it looks like you're having diffusion, when in reality, it's just that the center is having a faster uh, OGR recombination. So indeed, this proved to be true. So uh, the values of uh, diffusion that we get uh, for high fluences are completely uh, ridiculous. They make no sense. So this is why I labeled it the apparent. Uh, and actually, the slow values that we obtain are comparable to measurements that, that have been acquired with other techniques. So here, the, the message is, by having this uh, ability to measure 100 points in parallel, and increase our sensitivity by a factor of 10, that allows us to photo excite at much lower uh, fluences. And by exciting at lower fluences, I can do an experiment that is proper, in the sense that I am not inducing OGR, excess OGR recombination at any given part of my excitation spots. And therefore, I can do something that makes some sense. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I already mentioned all that I needed to. So uh, that brings me to the end for today. Uh, I hope that I uh, showed you that this crazy combination of femtosecond pulses with uh, holography lets us do pump probe uh, imaging in a, in a short noise limited way. 
So now we have access to large fields of view in van Grove microscopy. And I hope that I showed you also that uh, by combining that with digital holography, you can do some 3D uh, phototransient imaging, where you can use the uh, pump probe signal of individual nano objects to have contrast, to see them and switch off everything else, and also get some uh, three-dimensional information. And finally, uh, we, I showed you a trick where we can adapt this setup to study uh, uh, diffusion properties in materials. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Do you have uh, what think about the temperature? And I'm sure that this is a problem. Would you be so kind to discuss it the local temperature? So uh, the local temperature, um, okay. So here I am at a, a repetition rate that is uh, two kilohertz. Right, so this means that I have a, uh, one excitation pulse every, um, every 500 microseconds. And this is usually enough time for the temperature to be dissipated between consecutive shots uh, for these specific samples. Uh, the local temperature at time zero, like the electronic temperature from the hot carriers, I don't know if that's what you meant. Uh, then that's a, a different thing and it can reach, uh, I think, thousands of Kelvin and they are dissipated very quickly in the first uh, few picoseconds. Sorry, a few hundred femtoseconds. You are talking about diffusion of carriers. Yeah. So if you have diffusion of carriers, you have thermal diffusion. Yeah. If you compare them, the, the, the diffusion of the carriers is much uh, higher, much uh, with uh, higher velocity than the thermal diffusion. Yeah. You mean the temperature is constant of this diffusion of the carriers? This is my question. So uh, the temperature of what? So the usually local temperature of the flow. You look, your pulse is Gaussian. Yeah. So uh, you absorb in a local place. Yeah. Do you have a, a temperature gradient? You will have one, yes. You will have one eventually. So uh, you're right. So uh, basically, uh, uh, so the way I, I was taught to think about this is as a, or at time zero, you have a true temperature model. So immediately after right absorption, you have some a thermal distribution. And then in, very quickly, maybe 10 femtoseconds, you're going to form a Fermi Dirac distribution of carriers that is going to have a characteristic temperature that is higher than that of the lattice. Right, so this is going to cool down on a time scale of uh, less than one picosecond, and uh, so. But that, uh, okay, that is going to deposit more energy into the lattice at the center of the spot than at the edges of the spot, as you were saying. So uh, yes, I I never thought about how that would give a, a, if that would give an artifact on the analysis of these measurements. Yeah. So do you have thoughts on that thing? Uh, oh, I'm just asking. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, but, but that's, uh, that's absolutely right. So uh, at least as far as the first uh, picosecond is concerned, okay, fine. Uh, you don't have a, a relevant temperature gradient, but then of course, since you have more carriers at the center than at the edges, all of the excess photon energy is going to be dissipated locally uh, with a gradient. So yes, that, we have to take that into account somehow. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I don't have further comments, I'm sorry. Uh, so when you were discussing this array, you uh, some spots were darker than, than the other. So, yeah. So you have uh, homogeneity. Uh, meaning that uh, some of them are decaying faster, others slower. Uh, no, no, actually, uh, so yeah, we performed some analysis on this and uh, it turns out that uh, they were basically having the same uh, diffusion properties. No, but, uh, and, and I think here, for, you mean for instance, that this one is stronger than that one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that is probably uh, because we might be hitting a, a grain boundary where we have less absorption uh, or we might be an... Uh, so this is a single color technique, right? So I'm selecting the probe wavelength, and this uh, uh, line shape of the band gap 
is inhomogeneously broadened. So it might be that I'm just uh, some some of the crystals in my polycrystalline film are a bit shifted to the red or the blue based on the on their micro environment. And what we are seeing there, some are stronger, some are weaker, because my probe wavelength is more or less resonant with this peak. Does it have anything to do with, uh, with the... Yeah, no, the, the kinetics, the the kinetics were yeah. that spot on the same, yes. So, Much short disappointment. We were hoping to see kinetic differences, but actually we saw that no, it just looks like maybe it is uh, the, the spectral uh, inhomogeneity of the gap with respect to the wavelength of our probe. But on the other hand, the fusion is homogeneous, or is that also the same? Problem? No, no, it was it was sadly homogeneous for for this sample at least. Yeah. So the the they, when you when you do the analysis, they all came back uh, uh, the same. So the region is too small. So uh, I think the, the the crystals were large enough, uh, and uh, maybe the the quality of the sample was sufficient. So uh, I guess, uh, yeah, if, if it were too heterogeneous, it would probably mean that we had a bad sample, right? And then I guess our material science collaborators would be not happy to publish that. But uh, yeah, no, in this specific case, uh, we were hoping to have something homogeneous and it was not. So it is uh, the, the, in the signal intensity, yes. And we think it is because of uh, the, the band gap uh, in homogeneity. Uh, but in the kinetics and in the in the in the analysis of the diffusion, they came back solidly uh, in the same values. So uh, it would be nice to to have something where this would be different, just to show the the possibility of measuring it. You know, since it's a new technique. But yeah, it was not for these samples at least. Just one question: uh, what's, Which is the, the, the solution for the spot that you have? Here? Right, so, uh, okay, this is something I didn't mention before. So it's written here. Uh, the, the spots were about uh, uh, 756 nanometers in full width at half maximum. The objective was, uh, I think, uh, 0 0.8 and 8. So uh, we were not pushing any of these because I don't have funding for this. So this is like the crazy idea that you build with residual funding and our camera costs 300 euros. So in principle, with money, this can be improved by uh, a factor of over 100 by having a, a proper objective, a proper camera, and et cetera, et cetera. And a proper laser with a better repetition rate. Because uh, now we are stuck at uh, five, um, sorry, two kilohertz. And uh, maybe if we were a bit higher in repetition rate, we're still good enough that the sample relaxes to the ground safe between shots, but we can get higher sensitivity. So, uh, uh, yeah, it, this is the, the state, uh, I mean, this is a demonstration of what could be done. If you think about it, if I had a camera, and these exist, um, so there's a camera available in the market that has a uh, 100 times the, the sensor area respect to this. So for instance, for a sample like the one that I showed you, instead of having 100 spots, I could have uh, uh, 10,000 spots. And if I have 10,000 spots, it's crazy, right? I, I can do things that other people cannot dream of doing. So uh, basically, uh, at this point, we are uh, resource limited. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, this, all of this has been done with the cheapest stuff we could uh, find to make it work. Cheers. Any more questions? Anybody who's watching online? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, small question. Uh, what is the limitation to go to higher repetition rates for the, the laser? Having money. Uh, money, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, ideally you would buy some of those uh, fancy systems from light conversion like the carbide or the Faros, where you can tune the repetition rate. So you can operate it uh, at very high pulse energies, so you can use nonlinear optics. But you can go from the kilohertz to one megahertz selectively. So though that would be like the dream system, because if your sample has a very long, excited say, lifetime, or if it does not dissipate heat very well, etc., you can go to the low rep rate. But then, if you have a sample that has short lifetimes and dissipates heat, and etc., you can go to the um, high rep rate and get much, much better sensitivity. At the end of the day, the the I'm I'm dismissing my camera as some 
cheap piece of crap for 300 euros, but actually it is a very nice camera for 300 euros. It goes to 500 hertz of frame rate. So I can almost do the shot to shot thing uh, with the camera that I have, right? So uh, if you're at that low repetition rate, all this talk of holography and etc., you can kind of get away without doing it. So it, it is the nicest if you had the, the, the correct laser system, which currently I don't, but yeah, we're working on it. Time jitter is a problem, is an issue? The, the, the... No, the, the pulses are coming from the same laser. So, uh, yeah, no time jitter. Uh, yeah. So, the, 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 the jitters that are problems are like if you have pointing jitter, that is chaos. Because uh, we are doing, we have a reference wave, and if the reference wave shakes, all hell breaks loose. So, pointing jitter is, is very problematic. And uh, this, is, uh, this is interferometric. So, if there's your colleague on the other side of the optical table and he drops a screwdriver, everything jumps and goes to hell. So yeah, it, it's, yeah, you have to have a stable laser and a stable lab. And also, of course, if the objective is shaking, if the sample is shaking. So now that we're trying to push a little bit on the spatial resolution, we're finding that a lot of things shake. <laughs> there are no more questions. Let's thank Frank Oriani. Thank you for your nice talk. Thanks for inviting me, yeah.